Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our continuing series of stories about Pensacola and some of its historical figures. And today we're going to talk about a, a very unique man in Pensacola's history, Stephen Russell Mallory. Now, Mallory was got off in life, his start in life was very, very different. He was born uh, not in the United States, but in Trinidad in 1812, uh, a family of, uh, of some means. Uh, he had a good education, part of which was, uh, was undertaken in Mobile. And after a time, he became a practicing attorney and then became a part of the Federal Customs Service. And in that role, he, of course, was required to go from port to port making certain uh, studies and pronouncements. And uh, in the uh, in part of his early life, he uh, arrived here in Pensacola, and the story goes something like this. He was he and some other businessmen were, were discussing customs affairs down on the Palafox Pier, <clears throat> and along, along came a trio of very beautiful young ladies. Now, why they were on Pensacola or Palafox Pier, I don't know, but they were there, and one of these ladies was absolutely striking, and Mallory saw her, and he his heart just collapsed. He thought, oh, I've got to meet this lady, and so he engineered an introduction and young Angela Marino would have nothing to do with them. She was a very proper young lady, and she, without the proper uh, functioning uh, uh, introduction, she would have nothing to do with them. But, but Mallory, Mallory was was smitten, and so in in the in subsequent months, he paid a return to Pensacola. He paid court to the young lady, and uh, after a while, she she uh, recognized that this young man had something to offer, and they were married. Well, he continued his career and was doing well down in South Florida, so, so well in fact that he was being recognized by members of the legislature for his good works. And in 1850, the, uh, the legislature decided they were going to make a change. By, the, by now, of course, we, we, Florida had been a part of the United States for, as, a, as a state for five years. Thus, we were entitled to two United States senators. These men, of course, would be chosen by the legislature, not pu by public uh, vote. And uh, they were, the legislators were unhappy with a man who had been in, in office. And so they decided to change, and they chose Stephen R. Mallory. Well, Mallory, of course, uh, was not a politician, but he, he was smart enough to recognize that he, he, he ought to make a, before he went to Washington, he ought to make a visit, a, a call, a circuit, to, to all the population centers so people would, would know who he was, what nobody looked like, and he would talk to them, say, by basically saying, what do you want me to do? Well, of course, since he, had, he was married to a lovely lady from Pensacola, he expected when he arrived here that he was going to get a red, get red carpet treatment by all of the folks around, and uh, it didn't work out that way. Now, we had no Chamber of Commerce then, but we did have a number of very viable vi business leaders and these men had an agenda. And when they met with him in the in Garnier's Tavern that night, they laid it out this way. He said, look, look Senator, uh, we've had a Navy Yard here now for 25 years. We have never yet built one rowboat. We haven't built a ship. What we want is jobs and contracts to build ships. Now, of course, that doesn't sound terribly different than the 21st century. People are always looking for ways in, in which they can uh, improve the economy in such ways. And consequently, Mallory got the message. He went to Washington, and the, uh, by good fortune, there was an opening on the Senate Naval Affairs Committee. And he gained that job. And after a couple of years, the, the rather ancient or rather aging chairman of that committee retired. And so Mallory engineered uh, a few votes here and there, and he became the chairman of the Naval Affairs Committee. Now, he didn't get these new ships for Pensacola very quickly. In other words, it took, it took almost five years before the, first, before the contract was issued. But he was able to send a, an email back here to the leaders of Pensacola saying, I, I, I've done what you asked me. Uh, they're going to start work very shortly out at the Navy Yard. They're going to build a 3,000-ton a sloop, a steam-fired vessel, which will be where they're going to name the USS Pensacola. And they're going to build a smaller one, a tender, uh, 810 uh, tons, and she's going to be called the USS Seminole. They're going to start work on these very quickly, and they did. So all through the 1850s, when the, when the war clouds were developing over the land, Mr. Mallory was a part of the naval affairs operations of the Senate. So he became better, probably better, better acquainted than anyone in the Congress with what 
the naval operation of the country was all about. He knew where all of the pieces were, where all the things that were necessary. He knew where the leadership was. And so uh, he, he was sitting in that position when Florida uh, seceded from the Union early in 1861. As that happened, of course, first of all, we our area here, where for about six weeks we became the, uh, the Republic of West Florida. And then when, in uh, February of 1861, the Confederate States of America was organized, and the uh, people there in, in, uh, Rich, in uh, Montgomery, as that took place, elected a, another outgoing uh, United States senator uh, from the state of Mississippi, who uh, would become the president of the Confederacy. And of course, Jefferson Davis and uh, Stephen Mallory were friends. They had sat practically next to each other in the Congress. And of course, one of the first things that Mr. Mr. Davis did was to ask Mr. Mallory if he would take his broad expertise in naval affairs and become the Secretary of the Navy for the Confederacy. And Mr. Mallory accepted. And so very quickly, uh, he had to make arrangements, uh, first of all, for his family. And the fam by then, the, of course, he and, uh, and Angela had children, and they, were, they agreed they were going to remain right here in Pensacola, and that's what they did for the next 13 months. Mr. Mallory himself, of course, first of all, was uh, on, on board at, in Montgomery, and then, of course, very quickly, the capital of the Confederacy was moved to Richmond and that's where he began his work. Now we, we remember what Mallory did because it was so unique. Here he was, the Secretary of the Navy for a new republic, a republic which had virtually none of the elements necessary for a naval force. And as the war was now beginning, it was obvious that uh, they, the South had to have a navy. So Mallory went, went about doing things, recognizing quickly that he be, had become aware over his last 10 years in, in office in Washington, he had become aware of the shortcomings, but also where things were that he could use. And the first thing that he did, of course, was to try and encourage men who were experienced officers in the United States Navy to join the Southern Navy. And there was a, a virtually a, a flood of young, very talented, young and not so young, very talented officers who became the nucleus of this new Navy. Next, Mr. Mallory turned to Great Britain. And using some, uh, some emissaries of very able negotiators, uh, he sent uh, messages to the major shipyards in Great Britain trying to find out if there were vessels almost completed there, which might be uh, purchased by the South and translated or transferred, uh, transformed into a, uh, into, a na into naval vessels. And he was partially successful. He had, he had several that he did uh, arrange to buy, and one of which, of course, ultimately became the, the very famous vessel, the uh, Confederate States ship Alabama. But, but basically, he began to try to buy ships wherever he could, and he was, I say, he had a modest success at that. The second thing, of course, Mallory recognized was that there was going to have to be defense of certain parts of the South. One of the great areas of concern was the, the Mississippi River, because everyone recognized that if the Federal uh, Navy could gain total control of the Mississippi, they could literally squeeze the South between the forces on the Atlantic and the Mississippi. So quickly, Mallory began to de de uh, develop vessels which could be used particularly at New Orleans and again at uh, uh, up along the Mississippi uh, uh, at, at Natchez and Vicksburg. So basically what they did was to buy large barges, or get, obtain large large barges and get a steel plate or, or iron plate and put that plating along the sides of the of the barges, uh, then put cannon on the vessels so that they would act as a defense mechanism. And it was, well, we'll have to say that it was partially successful and re we kept the, the Federals out until the a great attack by Admiral Farragut early in April of 1862. The next thing Mallory did was to try and develop a, a mechanism which would help protect the, 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 the ports and harbors of the South. And this was what he called then a torpedo. Now the torpedo was actually a, a, a beer keg with a, a particular points put on it. The beer keg was loaded with powder. It had percussion caps on the end. And these, these kegs were put in position, anchored in position so that in, incoming enemy vessels might strike them. And of course, create, there would be a, an explosion might result. And, and they did, they, they, were, they were quite successful in a number of instances. And they kept the America, the uh, federal uh, Navy uh, vessels from entering easily. The next thing, of course, he wanted to do was to, to put together something that would, uh, would be, uh, uh, oh, perhaps even more successful than that, and that was a, a, a mechanism that would, might be uh, in a position to attack the uh, federal vessels in a way that they could not defend. And that, of course, was an, a vessel that was iron 
clad. It was, it was covered by, by armor. And so they took a, a former commercial vessel called the Virginia, and they plated it carefully with this, put on new cannon, and the Virginia was renamed the, the Merrimack, and consequently that vessel was sent forth in the, in the port of, uh, of uh, Norfolk, attacking uh, incoming uh, federal naval vessels, and the, the, the Merrimack was a, an immediate success. And of course, it, it just frightened the federal navy to death, because they had no idea that people there had no idea how many of uh, such vessels Ma Mallory might have put together, and the, the, the iron-plated uh, uh, attack vessel certainly was superior to anything that, the that could be put against it, and the, uh, they were just worried to death. But then, of course, the, uh, as every, everyone who has studied American history will remember, a, uh, an inventor by the name of Erickson, working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, came up with a small, uh, much smaller type of vessel, but also ironclad, and it was called the Monitor. And they steamed the Monitor south, and in a classic battle in Norfolk Harbor, the Monitor in America bounced cannonballs off of one another for, a, for a, almost a full day, neither one uh, achieving success. Uh, unfortunately for the South, uh, uh, when they tried to, to run the, the Merrimack out into a, and relocate it, she sank out in the Atlantic. And of course, only recently has the vessel been uh, located and brought up, and now she's being studied uh, by, uh, by, uh, by archaeologists with naval background. The other thing that, the, that uh, of course, the... Uh, the uh, Mallory group put together was the submarine. The submarine was, well, they had made three efforts. Of, now, and please understand, the idea of a submarine, a submersible, was not new. Uh, people had been looking at this sort of thing from, from Napoleon's time. Uh, several others, in, up in uh, particularly in New York State, had worked on this early on, and none of them had been successful. But in, Pensac in, uh, in Mobile, a group of people uh, put together a, a, a vessel which was uh, basically, it looked like oh, sort of like a cigar. It was uh, long enough to seat eight men, uh, each one of which were Worked at, which one of whom worked at a crank, and these men would, would be able to turn that crank, which in turn turned a shaft, which, in, which was hitched to a propeller, and that was the means of propulsion. The, uh, the vessel had a, a periscope type arrangement on the back so that the steersman could see where they were going, and on the front they would attach one of these torpedoes as an explosive device. And the idea was to, to uh, run the, uh, the vessel uh, through the water and ram into a, a wooden vessel ahead with the explosive on the end exploding. And this, of course, was to, to blow a hole in the in the uh, in the wooden vessel. And, and uh, they brought the, uh, the 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 vessel, which they called the Hunley. They took it on a flat car from Mobile, took it to Norfolk, and had two trials. And bo in both trials, the, the Hunley sank. They had just had, had two great misadventures. But on the third attempt, with a new crew, or new crew, of course, they had to have the others had died. Uh, this third crew was successful, and the vessel rammed against the uh, the Federal warship Housatonic, and she sank. Well. Well, this was based, this was the kind of thing that Mallory did all through the war. He came up with innovation after innovation, which allowed the for the, for the Southern Navy to to be, be active and to have a degree of success. When the war ended, of course, Mr. Mallory was among the cabinet members as they retreated from Washington, uh, for rather from from Richmond. They, they passed through the South. They finally dispersed after a final meeting in at Washington, Georgia. Mr. Mallory was captured by by federal forces and put in prison in the in the North. Uh, it looked for a while like he might be tried for treason by the uh, by the Hawks and the Congress, but President Johnson d d would not allow that. He pardoned Mr. Mallory. He came back, uh, entered, came back to Pensacola, restored his home, went into legal practice here with a partner named Augustus Maxwell, and so served until his death in 1873. Mr. Mallory is buried in uh, St. Michael's Cemetery, and it's kind of an unusual burial place because uh, his, pr his uh, followers make sure that every day there is a flag flying above his grave, and they alternate the flags, the American flag one day, the, federal, the Confederate flag another. And so in that way today, it's worthy that we do, do recognize the contributions that this unique man made. He was a, one of the few people who served all through the, the Civil War uh, in the cabinet. He did his best, and of course we remember him for all sorts of good things that he did otherwise. Stephen Russell Mallory, one of Pensacola's unique citizens.